You want a war? You're gonna get one. Now get the gun! Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 22nd of February 1999. It's the night after Super Brawl 9, WCW Nitro comes from Sacramento, California while WWF Raw takes place in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Super Brawl 9 was a decent card in my opinion but the ending was like a bad joke. David Flair has joined the NWO Wolfpack Elite and this week on Nitro Rick and David will have a face to face discussion about what happened at the pay per view. WCW have even set up a little private room for the Flares to hash things out. David and Samantha are seen inside the room and Samantha says she's proud of young David and get this, David says it's now his time to shine. Mate, I've seen you wrestle on two occasions and both times I almost died of laughter. Let's be honest here, David is really bad in the ring, he makes Steve McMichael look like Shawn Michaels, he seems incredibly nervous and self aware during promos and someone thought it would be a good idea to put him in the NWO Wolfpack. On a brighter note, we've got a jam up brother and sister combo this week for extra jamminess. Ben showed how much of an awesome brother he really is by taking his little sister to AEW Collision and Battle of the Belts 8 in Memphis. Little Samantha took the time to draw Smokey the Cat in his big pot of jam along with Bret Hart but unfortunately she accidentally left her drawing in the FedEx forum when she and Ben left the arena. Someone out there has that drawing and by god we need to get it back. Thank you so much Ben and Samantha for sending in your photo and I hope you enjoy this week's episode of Reliving the War. Ricky Rackman, who real ones may remember from Headbangers Ball, is on tour with WCW to promote the upcoming Spring Break episode of Nitro. WCW are visiting campuses across America on their way to Panama City Beach, and yeah, that's a 1999 haircut if you've ever seen one. A highlight video aired on Nitro that focused on the whole Scott Steiner and Kimberly Page fiasco, and Tony Schiavone confirms that DDP didn't agree to Steiner getting Kimberly for 30 days if he lost the match at Super Brawl, so it appears Kim won't be getting a piece of the big bad booty daddy anytime soon. You won't believe who kicked off the in ring action this week on Nitro. You wanna talk about barn burners? How about Mike Enos vs Jerry Flynn? Forget the finger poke of doom and all that nonsense, we've had David Flair, Ricky Rackman and Jerry Flynn vs Mike Enos to begin Monday Nitro. This is why people were switching off. The match was boring, nobody cared. As mentioned last week, Mike Enos wanted a no win clause written in his contract and he simply refuses to win matches. He politics backstage to do nothing but jobs, he's like the anti Hulk Hogan. So Jerry Lynn with an F wins with his new finisher, the cross arm breaker. I think it's his new finisher but I don't really care either. What I do care about is Booker T getting a match with Bret Hart a little later on, the winner of that match becomes the number one contender for the US title. Booker's all fired up after beating Disco Inferno last night, he says his knees nod 100%. The hitman has no love for Booker of course, but Mr T says 1999 will be his year and Bret better be ready to go all night long. Sounds erotic. Scott Norton just returned from a new Japan tour and he learns that Vincent is the new leader of the black and white. Norton's like, serious? And Vincent says, yes I am the man. Back in the ring we have a Van Hammer vs Bam Bam Bigelow match. Now I know what you're thinking and I thought the same too, but hold your judgement ladies and gentlemen because look, one chin lock from Bam Bam gets followed up with another, I didn't think he had it in him but Bam Bam applies another so boom. Bam Bam Bigelow chin lock, fuck yeah. Now, a chin lock connoisseur like yourself would be more than content with three devastating chin locks in one match, but wait, there's more. Bam Bam chin lock number four, Van Hammer getting wrecked, ha ha ha. Seeing as the British Bulldog has left us high and dry, we could very well be looking at the new chinlock master of reliving the war. But there you go, match of the week, no match of the month, this was way better than Austin vs McMahon. Greetings from Asbury Park gives Bam Bam the pinfall victory and Van Hammer had to get chin surgery, poor fella. 
Buff Bagwell and Scott Steiner are on their very own tour as they head to spring break. They stop off at a gym to get a little workout in, and a girl who Buff helped earlier on tells our heroes to stop by a club later on for an extra workout, if you know what I mean. So Buff and Stanner pull up in a Hummer limousine a little later on looking for the girl named Candy. They enter the establishment and it looks like Candy gave the lads directions to the neon cowboy. Buff and Stanner look a little shocked and Stanner even tries to launch an attack but Bagwell calmed him down. It appears that Candy took the Hummer so Buff and Scott need to get it back ASAP. We go back to the arena where Scott interrupts a Goldberg photo shoot, so that previous video was pre-taped. Scott and Goldberg have a match later tonight, and Steiner says Goldberg's next. Raw begins with a Vince McMahon promo, while next on Nitro it's Bret Hart vs Booker T. We still don't know the contents of that mysterious letter Vince received last week from The Undertaker, but we might find out more later on. Vince says tonight won't be for the weak at heart, we're gonna roast some human flesh inside the ring. The Undertaker wants to threaten the chairman, so Vince has booked Undertaker vs Kane in a disco inferno match. It's gonna be good. Vince then welcomes the WrestleMania main event guest referee to the ring, Paul White. Michael Cole says Vince went out and got himself the hottest free agent in the world when he signed White, and Jerry Lawler puts over how awesome the big man really is. Paul says he walked out of hell's fire, that being WCW, and he got welcomed through heaven's gates by Mr. McMahon. He says the WWF will never be the same again and the arrival of the giant is already paying dividends to Mr. McMahon and the corporation. Paul sends Steve Austin through a cage, he single-handedly put the WWF title around the rock's waist, and when Paul referees the WrestleMania main event, well, it'll be as simple as 1-2-3. The Rock's music plays in the arena and Vince looks surprised to see the WWF Champion make his way down to the ring. Rock steps inside the ropes and he asks McMahon if he heard Paul White correctly a few seconds ago. Did this big jabroni just say he single handedly put the WWF title around the Rock's waist last week? Paul says yes, The Rock heard him right and he's surprised Rock could hear anything through that thick skull of his. McMahon thinks the boys are just bantering here but Rock then asks a very important question. Vince? It's a joke. Who is this Rudy Poo? Rock can't believe that this guy would just walk in and talk to the great one that way. Paul White should know his role and Paul says Rock should shut his mouth or Paul will shut it up for him. McMahon tries to calm both men down but it doesn't work. Rock threatens to lay the smack down and look at Paul White just lift Vince up like a little child. <laughs> Mick Foley then shows up. Mick started a campaign on Sunday Night Heat to become the second guest referee for the WWF title match. And Mick thinks a great way to show his abilities as a referee would be to officiate a match between Rock and Paul White tonight on Raw. Vince McMahon doesn't want his men fighting of course, but Paul White wants to go and Rock says he'll check the big man into the Smackdown Hotel. Looks like we've got ourselves a WWF title match tonight on Raw's War. The winner of this Bret Hart vs Booker T match gets a shot at the US title. It's a match we've seen before and I always felt those previous matches could have been better. Let's see how this one plays out. The two shove each other a little before locking up and Booker gives a clean break in the corner. Bret performs a wrist lock counter but a back elbow sends his excellency to the outside. Smokey the Cat didn't approve. Bret's forced to the outside again after a shoulder tackle and a quick arm drag and when the match resumes it's hard bringing Booker to the corner for a few strikes and the hitman applies a chin lock. He didn't watch that Bam Bam Big Low match did he? Things then look bleak for Bret when Booker pulls off two clotheslines followed by the axe kick. The hitman kicks out at two so Booker starts working over the arm. We then cut over to Disco Inferno in the production truck and I'm sorry, WCW can go fuck themselves. No doubt you've noticed that WCW are putting way more emphasis on backstage skits and more elaborate promos, but cutting away from a Bret vs Booker match when a Jerry Flynn vs Mike Enos match went completely uninterrupted is nothing short of stupid. The one thing WCW still has going for it is the bell to bell action from guys who want to actually work and now the company seem hell bent on ruining that too. Anyway, the NWO want to take over the WCW satellite feed and Disco says they'll triple this guy's pay if he hands over some details about the feed. 
The production guy agrees to do it, and then we go back to the ring where Bret Hart is now in control. Booker takes a stun gun, a Russian leg sweep and an elbow drop from Bret's rope, and when Booker kicks out, the match goes to the outside where the hitman uses a steel chair. Back in the ring, Bret performs a backbreaker and he seems confused as to how Booker keeps kicking out. Booker comes firing back with a clothesline, but Bret gets back to his feet and Booker takes a back suplex. The hitman then tries to lock in a sharpshooter but it gets countered with a pin attempt. Hard kicks out, he body slams Booker, and Bret then applies a figure 4. The fans are really into this one as the arena starts to rumble. The audience are trying to will Booker back into the match and they cheer when Booker reverses the pressure. Bret grabs the bottom rope. The audience stays super hyped up as Booker performs his running forearm before hitting a spinning heel kick. Hart replies with a superplex and he goes for the sharpshooter once again. This time Booker grabs the bottom rope and Bret waits until the count of four before letting go. And the match ends with the classic Bret vs Bulldog SummerSlam 92 finish. This was some good stuff here and the audience helped make the match special, it's just a crying shame that the TV audience were forced away from the match. Booker T is now the number one contender for the US title, so maybe we'll see Booker T vs Scott Hall at Uncensored. Disco Inferno vs Kaz Hayashi on Nitro, The Brood vs Public Enemy on Raw Kaz Hayashi is wearing Glacier's entrance gear. On Thunder a few weeks ago, Glacier sold his outfit to Kaz while Ernest Miller was able to purchase Glacier's entrance. How the mighty have fallen. All that lore about Glacier's gear just gets pissed down the toilet in one single backstage segment, but gotta admit it is kinda funny. Disco wants to sing the national anthem at the beginning of the match, but his mic cuts out. So he attacks Kaz with that microphone and Disco takes the early lead. Kaz ends up on the outside, but he comes back in with a nice flying crossbody, a head scissor takedown then puts Disco out of the ring, and Kaz follows this up with a dive over the top rope. Great stuff here from Hayashi. Back in the ring, Disco takes a drop kick, but Kaz tries again and Disco holds onto the ropes. The Inferno puts Kaz down with a clothesline, he delivers a second rope elbow drop, but Kaz counters a powerbomb attempt with a Famouser, again this looked good. Kaz goes upstairs, he misses a back senton, so Disco ends it with a swinging neckbreaker followed by the chartbuster. I didn't expect Disco to lose this one if I'm honest, but the match was nothing special either. So the public enemy are now part of the WWF and they are going up against Gangrel and Edge of the Brood. The match is incredibly short with the Brood sending flyboy Rocco Rock and Johnny Grunge into each other and Rocco Rock getting singled out early on. Grunge comes in to lend his brother a hand with a double bulldog and Edge almost breaks his neck when public enemy perform a double flapjack. Gangrel gets double teamed next and Public Enemy are able to pull off their drive by finishing move, but Christian runs in to cause a DQ finish. Public Enemy decide to go outside to grab a few steam chairs, the lights then go out in the arena. When the lights come back on we can see Grunge and Rock have taken a bloodbath, so yeah, welcome to the WWF Public Enemy. During the next commercial break, The Undertaker wanted to punish the Brood for losing the match. He orders the Ministry of Darkness to attack Edge, Gangrel and Christian. And you know what, if I were a member of the Brood, I would have told Undertaker he can shove his ministry up his hole. We've got Ken Shamrock vs Billy Gunn next on Raw, plus a Sable promo. On Nitro, Brian Adams greets Scott Norton. So Brian Adams tells Scott Norton that he's the leader of the black and white and Scott doesn't mention anything about Vincent. Norton's now catching on that the boys are being played, yet it looks like Scott himself is just gonna play along. Norton asks Brian a few times if Adams is indeed the man and Brian seems a little confused as to why Scott's asking this, but Adams says yes and he's pretty sure he's also going to be part of the wolf pack soon enough as the two shake hands. Let's just skip ahead and cover the rest of this now. Scott also bumps into Horace Hogan later on and you guessed it, Horace tells Norton that he's the leader of the NWO and Scott's like yeah ok. So Norton hunts down Hulk Hogan to get to the bottom of all this and Hogan says that Scott's now the leader of the black and white. Now clearly Norton knows that the black and white are being played, you'd have to be a complete idiot not to see it. But he still accepts what Hogan says and he's thankful that Hollywood's giving him an opportunity. It's baffling, it really is. Intercontinental Champion Val Venus joins the commentary team to watch Shamrock vs Billy Gunn. The winner of this one faces Venus at Wrestlemania and I don't know guys, it kinda feels like this storylines run its course too. Shamrock wants to fight Val Venus, but didn't Val Venus just break up with Ken's sister? Didn't Kenny Boy get what he wanted? 
Shamrock takes a neckbreaker inside the ropes, but Billy misses a stinger splash and Kenny Boy lands a kick. Valvina says Shamrock's a virgin as Billy takes a DDT. The crowd then chant Where's Your Sister to Shamrock and this makes Ken lose it and he goes after Venus. However, Billy stops Ken from embarrassing himself and instead he takes a Famouser. Ken gets back to his feet and he explodes out of the corner with a clothesline. He follows this up with a jumping leg lariat followed by a Frankensteiner. Billy Gunn finds himself on the outside and when Val Venus throws him back in the ring, Ken Shamrock attacks the champion. All three men end up fighting on the outside, officials break it up. So we don't have a decisive number one contender for the IC title at WrestleMania. Ren Shamrock shows up because, I don't know, reasons? But Ken drags her back to the locker room so she can hang around with more of the boys. Backstage, Vince McMahon tries to convince The Rock to cancel tonight's title match, but The Rock says a champ's gotta do what a champ's gotta do. Rock is not backing down from Paul White, so the match is still gonna happen. Back in the arena, Sable puts herself over before calling her obsessed fan into the ring for a chat. We learn that this lady's named Tori, and Sable wants to know what is it that Tori loves so much about Mrs. Mero. Tori says Sable's beautiful, she's graceful, athletic and powerful. Sable says Tori's pathetic and she then says, and I quote, hit the road skank. Luna then shows up and Luna tells Sable she needs to understand that not everyone can be like Sable. Not all women were blessed with what Sable has, yet most women don't use people the way Sable uses people. Luna then says that the only reason Sable's WWF champion is because of her looks. Sable says she doesn't really care, all she cares about are the men. She then tells the production guys to hit her music and when Luna and Tori turn their backs, Sable attacks both women with her championship belt. The Sable heel turn is pretty effective, but I'm not sure turning Luna babyface again is such a good move. I know the babyface to heel ratio in the WWF's women's division needs to be carefully balanced because the roster's so small, but Luna's flip flopped so many times already since her WWF return. Vince McMahon then tries to talk Paul White out of the title match and Paul's not having it. The way Paul sees it, the championship belt will remain in the corporation so Vince shouldn't worry. Paul's here to be the corporation's main man so he still wants to fight Rock tonight for the WWF belt. Next on Raw, D'Lo challenges both Jeff Jarrett and Owen Hart. On Nitro, Scott Steiner cuts a promo. Tony Schiavone says Buff Bagwell's just been cleared to wrestle again, so Buff Daddy's gonna be in action very, very soon. Scott brings his new girl into the ring, and he says Diamond Dallas Page is not in the arena tonight because Scotty put him in hospital last night at Super Brawl. DDP was warned, but Page was still stupid enough to step into the ring with Big Papa Pump, and now Dallas has a problem because Steiner has Kimberly Page for 30 days and 30 nights. Tony Schiavone again says here that this isn't the case because that stipulation wasn't agreed upon. On, but Scotty thinks Kim's gonna call him the big bad booty daddy very very soon. Steiner says while DDP's on his back screaming in pain, his wife will be on her back screaming Scott's name. Brilliant. DDP's been taken out, Scott hurt his brother Rick, if Sting was around Scott would take him out too. The only man left for Steiner to demolish is Bill Goldberg and Scott promises to put Goldberg in hospital right next to Dallas Page. Swear to god, Scott Steiner better win that match. On Raw, D'Lo says Owen, Jeff and Deborah have taken out Mark Henry and Ivory. D'Lo still wants to fight Owen and Jeff in a two-on-one match tonight, and the tag team champions happily oblige. D'Lo impresses early on with this running sky high, but it's a typical numbers game right here. Anytime D'Lo gets the upper hand, one of his opponents are right there to stop him in his tracks. Owen and Jeff pull off a spinebuster and fist drop combo, but D'Lo stops an Owen Hart missile dropkick. PMS then walked down to the ring while Deborah gets on the apron, and just when D'Lo was getting a break, Jackie hits him with a drop kick to the back of the head. This leads to D'Lo taking a spinning wheel kick from Owen, and D'Lo gets pinned on Raw. It's kind of funny how five people in total had to get involved to stop the machine known as D'Lo Brown. D'Lo gets attacked after the match, officials run down to stop the beatdown, and we then see Mick Foley getting prepared for the next match. Rock vs Paul White's about to take place on Raw's War. On Nitro, it's Chris Jericho vs Hugh Morris, sounds delightful. On Raw, it's Rock vs Paul White. 
Jericho reminds fans that Saturn had a chance to ditch his dress last night at Super Brawl and Jericho concludes that Saturn must be a bit funny, seeing as Perry purposely lost his match at the pay per view. Saturn wearing a dress now offends Chris, it offends Rolfus and it offends the Jerichoholics, so Perry must remove that dress. Bit of a strange turn of events this, isn't it? Seeing as Chris was the one who forced Perry to wear a dress in the first place, but anyway, you can pretty much guarantee Saturn's going to interfere in this match now because WCW has really become that predictable. Jericho slaps Hugh Morris across the face and this leads to Morris getting the upper hand. The Ayatollah takes a press slam before Morris goes to the top rope, but Morris misses an elbow drop and Chris is able to apply some chin abuse. The action stays on the mat and Ralphus has a great old time watching the match unfold, what a hero. Morris gets up and delivers a great looking pop up sit down power bomb. he then hits a few corner splashes followed by a power slam in the middle of the ring. Morris wants to end it now with a moonsault but Ralphus grabs his leg and this leads to Saturn showing up to rip the dress off Ralphus' back, poor guy. Jimmy Hart then tries to hand Perry a steel chair but Mr Hart gets wiped out and Jericho takes a death valley driver. Morris then goes upstairs to hit the no laughing matter and Hugh Morris pins Chris Jericho in the middle of the ring, my my. After the bell Morris gets a little upset that Perry attacked Jimmy Hart, so Saturn gets invited into the ring for a fight and the two men slug it out while Chris Jericho is still laid out on the mat. Over on Raw, referee Mick Foley enters the ring first, closely followed by Mr McMahon. Vince tells Mick that the match isn't going to happen so he can stick Mr Socko where the sun doesn't shine, but Vince also looks very surprised when The Rock makes his entrance. Rock tells Vince to sit beside the jabronis at the commentary table because nothing's going to stop the great one sticking his food up Paul White's ass. So Vince joins the commentary team for this one as Paul White makes his way down to the ring. Michael Cole calls Paul Big Nasty here while Rock called him Big Time earlier in the show. Seems like they were maybe playing around with possible ring names. Rock and White square off, Mick Foley holds the championship belt in the air, the match begins with Paul shoving Rock into the ropes and Mick Foley then gets kicked in the head. Paul White and Rock then beat Mankind up and the match doesn't happen, it was all a set up and the crowd absolutely hated it. I think most people wanted to see this match take place and it does kinda smell like a WCW move right here but Rock and White had no intention of fighting at all and even Vince McMahon gets a shot in as the crowd continue to boo. The corporation beat up Mick Foley, they celebrate on the rampway, Mick's left all alone in the ring and Raw moves on to its next match. Steve Blackman takes on Draws next on Raw, on Nitro we've got a Kevin Nash promo. So Darren Drozdov made a terrible mistake last week on Raw and now he has to suffer the consequences. This is going to be a cakewalk for Stone Cold Steve Blackman. Draws uses his stupid hat to choke Blackman out and Blackman takes a clothesline. Draws kicks out of a sunset flip and Darren pulls off an elbow drop. That kind of thing though doesn't fly around here Mr Drozdov. Draws takes the hard stop and chest chop followed by the spine shatter and sidewalk slam. Draws pulls off a par slam because Steve felt sorry for him I guess. And the match comes to an end with the mudfug kick, absolute domination from Sensei Blackman. Feeling a surge of embarrassment, Draws attacks Steve after the match. He whispers into his ear 11th of July as Steve gets choked out with his own turbo sticks. And what does this mean? The big man comes to the ring with Lex Luger and Miss Elizabeth, he's still got Rey Mysterio's mask on his head and he says he just watched the Super Bowl tape back and he realised Scott Hall took a few shortcuts in their tag team match last night. Seeing as the NWO stand up for what's right in this sport, seeing as the NWO is all about fair play and seeing as Rey Mysterio was upset enough to demand a match against Kevin Nash tonight on Nitro, Big Sexy wants Mysterio to come down and Kevin will give him his mask back, it doesn't fit Kev anyway. Mysterio comes down and he says it's not about the mask anymore, Kevin got what he wanted, it's time for Mysterio to get what he wants and that's a match against the big man. Kevin says Mysterio's ripping off the No Limit Soldiers with his get up, but if Ray wants a match right now then so be it. 
Liz and Lex get out of the ring. We hear the bell. Nash mocks Mysterio for being a little short, and Mysterio goes down after a knee strike. Mysterio finds himself on the apron and he tries a springboard attack. Kev ducks it, but Ray hits a low drop kick. The crowd goes crazy when Mysterio hits a spinning wheel kick and Ray then pulls off a springboard face buster. The crowd continue to go nuts when Mysterio delivers a Bronco Buster. It was all going so well, but Kev catches Mysterio out and Ray gets hit with snake eyes. We then see a huge bail from Kev that sends Mysterio soaring through the air, and Big Sexy now has a smile on his face as he signals for the jackknife. Mysterio's in place for the finish, Kev lifts him up, but Mysterio lands a few punches and Nash falls on his back. Mysterio covers his opponent, and Ray defeats Kev and Nash on Monday Nitro. The audience absolutely loved the outcome and it was a good call giving Ray the win here. I'd really like to see these two have a proper long match because their opposing styles really complement one another. Barry Windham and Kurt Hennig cut a promo next on Nitro. On Raw, we've got Val Venus vs Goldust. The new tag team champions come out and Kurt 2 says 11th of July as he joins Mean Gene for an interview. This is getting weird. Kurt says he told everyone all along that he and Barry Windham were going to win the tag team championships. He says Benoit and Malenko are good and the champs underestimated their opponents, but there's a difference between being good and being great. Windham says the champs are in no rush to sign a rematch contract and the horsemen shouldn't be either. The four horsemen are having a pretty rough week so Flair and company should maybe focus on other matters right now. Mean Gene tells Hennig that Malenko and Benoit deserve a shot after what happened last night but Kurt Hennig disagrees. The new champs dictate when the belts get defended and the new champs are in no rush to wrestle the four horsemen. Before our next Raw match, we see Vince McMahon ordering Kane to destroy his brother later tonight in the Raw main event. Vince is also holding that letter that The Undertaker sent him last week. Meanwhile, the Prince of Darkness says he's poised to begin his reign of terror over the WWF in the name of his master, the Greater Power. Vince now has a bigger problem than Stone Cold Steve Austin, an inferno match is pointless because there's some flames that can't be extinguished and The Undertaker is one of those flames. The Dead Man has a surprise for Vince tonight and The Undertaker is going to show Vince how serious his threat really is. This Raw match is not for the Intercontinental title, so that means Val Venus is probably going to lose. Val also broke the golden rule by getting involved in a match earlier on, but surprisingly, it wasn't Ken Shamrock or Billy Gunn who came out to attack Venus. No, it was the Blue Meanie. Val gets planted with the DDT on the outside and the commentators are as confused as everyone else. Goldust takes the pinfall win and he's unsure why his arch nemesis helped him out in this match. But Goldust now has a pinfall victory over the IC champion and you'd assume that also puts him in the running for a title match down the road. Backstage, we see Shane McMahon checking himself out while China gives the European champion a little encouragement. China faces X-Pac a little later on and if X-Pac wins, then the kid will face Shane at WrestleMania for the European Championship. The new Midnight Express explodes as Bart Gunn takes on Bob Holly for the hardcore belt. On Nitro, Ernest Miller lays out a challenge to a certain member of the NWO. So Ernie Miller comes out the Glacier's music, he has the lasers and he's got the snow, and he then decides he doesn't like this quote redneck music and he wants his James Brown music instead. Just completely acknowledging here that his theme song named I'm the Greatest was indeed a blatant James Brown ripoff. Ernest isn't issuing an open challenge this week though, he's challenging Scott Norton. Norton destroyed Miller a few weeks back if you remember, plus Ernest wants to get revenge for all of Sonny Ono's family members that Scott beat up in Japan. The NWO tells Norton that Ernest is challenging him, he doesn't believe it at first but then he hears it from Miller's mouth. So Scott walks down to the ring and we've got a two minute match right here. It started off much like the last match with Miller getting dominated and Scott having some fun at his opponent's expense, but Miller was able to floor Norton after a few kicks and the cat thought he had a chance. Norton answered right away with a body slam followed by his signature powerbomb. Scott covers Miller by placing his fingertips on the cat's chest and Scott Norton beats Miller again on Nitro. What I find weird is the fact that Norton didn't mention the whole leadership of the NWO thing to his comrades backstage, but I honestly think no one cares anymore. On Raw, we get the in-ring return of Bart Gunn, but it doesn't start off too well for the Brawl for All champion. The match goes to the outside where Holly smashes a jug over Bart's head and Bart takes a chair shot immediately afterwards. Chair shots are magically less effective in hardcore matches though, so Bob gets a taste of his own medicine when more glass gets smashed and the hardcore champ gets his bell rung. 
After a brief fight in the audience, Holly comes back by using a fire extinguisher. A nice bucket then becomes a lethal weapon in the hands of Bombastic Bob and Bart also takes a bump at the ring steps. Again, Bart returns the favour by doing the exact same spots, so we seem to be struggling creatively here. Things do get a bit better when both men end up on the entrance stage and Holly gets smacked with a melon, uh, I mean why not? And Bart also breaks a metal pole over Sparky Plug's back. Holly then… <laughs> Holly uses a crate of bananas to his advantage because Bob Holly loves a good banana every now and then. And the food warfare continues when Bart utilises some flour to his advantage. That'll be the last time Shawn Michaels leaves his luggage sitting at the entrance stage. The match ends when someone wearing a mask shows up to throw Bart Gunn off the stage. The commentators have no idea who this is, but Jerry Lawler guesses it's the food vendor. Holly covers Gunn, the hardcore champ retains his title, and this is the last time we'll see Bart Gunn until WrestleMania. WrestleMania serves as Bart's last relive in the war appearance. For those wondering, the masked man will get revealed next week on Raw. X-Pac takes on China in the Raw semi-main event while WCW presents Goldberg vs Scotty Steiner. I know it's unlikely, but I really want Steiner to win this. He's been one of the best things about Nitro these past few months and he could really make a name for himself by pinning Goldberg. Steiner thinks Goldberg isn't going to show up and he challenges anyone in the arena for a fight, but Goldberg marches down to the ring and we get a stare down between the two competitors. Goldberg shoves Scott, the two lock up, and Steiner lays in a few shots when they go to the corner. Scott avoids a backdrop and he once again tries attacking Goldberg in the corner, but Billy Boy starts no selling and Steiner ends up taking a boot to the face and a few punches to the head. The crowd goes crazy when Goldberg goes for a gorilla press, and Bobby Heenan sounds legitimately angry when WCW has to take a commercial break in the middle of the match. We come back to see Goldberg chasing Buff Bagwell around the outside of the ring. Steiner intercepts his opponent though and Bill takes a ring step bump before the two get back inside the ropes. Goldberg, uh, <laughs> yeah, he gets a little tied up for a moment. He frees himself from the deadly clutches of the ring ropes only to take a Steiner line followed by an elbow drop. Goldberg then takes a belly to belly and Buff Bagwell decides to once again cut the turnbuckle pad off the top turnbuckle and he also throws referee Johnny Boone out of the ring. Unfortunately, it's Scott Steiner who takes a bump at the exposed turnbuckle and Bagwell gets welcomed back to the ring with a spear from Goldberg. Scott and Buff then leave the ring, but a returning Rick Steiner shows up to hit a double Steiner line. The referee decides to disqualify Scotty Steiner so Goldberg wins the match, but at least Scott didn't take a pinfall loss. The NWO black and white then come down and they all try to order each other to get in the ring. In the end, they sacrifice Vincent and he ends up getting his head taken off with a clothesline from Rick and he also gets spared out of his boots by Goldberg. The match quality wasn't great here, but the crowd reaction definitely made up for it. Nitro had a great audience in attendance this week. On Raw, Shane McMahon says there's no way X-Punk can get through the ninth wonder of the world tonight. That WrestleMania title shot the kid wants ain't gonna happen. X-Pac runs down to the ring and he goes after Shane. This leads to China hitting a low blow and Triple H decides to chase Shane around the ring while the match gets underway. X-Pac falls in position for a Bronco Buster after taking a forearm, but Pac dodges it and when China hits the bottom turnbuckle, Waltman decides to leave the ring to chase Shane McMahon around. Shane -O must have been absolutely exhausted after this match. The referee then chases X-Pac around, so Triple H gets in the ring and he hits China with a pedigree. X-Pac covers China and kids go into WrestleMania to compete in his first ever WrestleMania match, believe it or not. Triple H says that's one bitch down, one to go, and X-Pac says he'll see Shane at WrestleMania and there's nothing Shane or his dad can do about it. We end Raw with an Undertaker vs Kane Inferno match. On Nitro, we were supposed to have the Ric Flair and David Flair face to face confrontation. So Tony Schiavone is getting ready to mediate this conversation between David Flair and Ric Flair. Disco Inferno, meanwhile, is in the truck trying to convince our guy to hijack the satellite feed. The production guy's having second thoughts though. Ric Flair's limousine pulls up to the arena, but we quickly cut over to Hulk Hogan and Kevin Nash as the feed gets hijacked. The boys laugh as an NWO pre taped video begins to play, and this, ladies and gents, is what airs on Nitro before the show comes to an end. We see David Flair lying on Samantha in the most uncomfortable looking position possible, and Disco walks in dressed up as Mean Gene. Mean Gene Inferno asks David what was he thinking at Super Brawl, and David says that he's the new Space Mountain. I wish I was joking, but I'm not. Kevin Nash reprises his role as Arn Anderson, and we've also got Vincent dressed as Steve McMichael, who's also dressed up as a bear. 
Kevin Anderson goes through the same spot routine he did back when the NWO mocked the horseman in 1997, and he also shows young David how to open a can of beer with a tire iron. Scott Hall's here is Roddy Piper, he says he's called the hot rod because he's got six kids, and he also called Samantha a hussy. Here comes Hollywood Ric Flair styling and profiling into this promo. Flair says he went home a beaten man after Super Brawl even though he danced all night and he danced a little longer. He says he's wearing an Armani Gucci Pucci Smoochie shirt, what the fuck? He then says his shoes cost more than what Arn Anderson drank last night, and he ends up handcuffing himself to Samantha while saying he's not freeing himself until she's had a ride on the old Space Mountain. Disco ends it by saying you gotta phone the hotline to get all the details regarding David Flair and his new girlfriend. And yeah, parts of this were funny and it was quite amusing seeing Hogan doing a Ric Flair impersonation, but ending Nitro with this video was a really strange choice. I'm guessing everyone thought it was better than what it really was. On a more positive note though, that means Scotty Steiner actually main evented Nitro this week, so let's look on the bright side. On Raw, Vince McMahon comes to the ring and he says no one threatens him the way The Undertaker tried to in that mysterious letter. Undertaker's gonna pay for his sins by burning in hell in this inferno match. And Vince then joins the commentary team as the competitors make their way down to the ring. When Michael Cole questions Vince about the contents of the letter, McMahon doesn't give much away, but he does say it's personal. So this is the first Undertaker match we've seen since back at rock bottom. The flames surround the ring and Taker starts it off by delivering old school to his little brother. Kane replies with a power slam. As Kane stays on offense, the commentators continue to question McMahon in regards to the letter but he still won't give anything away. All he says is it's personal. He also says Kane won't let the corporation down in this match as the big red machine performs a suplex. And then Paul Bearer walks down the ringside holding a box. Paul delivers the box to Vince, it's a special gift for the chairman, but Vince is in no rush to open it up as Kane tries to put his brother's face into the fire. Finally, Vince opens up the box and inside is a little teddy bear, it's Teddy Rubskin. Vince stands up and he begins walking around the ring while holding the bear. He asks Paul why would he do such a thing and Paul's like, I don't know, it's kind of funny though. The Undertaker then gets thrown out of the ring and he made sure to stay away from the Disco Inferno when going over. And Kane tries a top rope move here but he ends up crashing into the announce table. When Kane goes for a big boot, The Undertaker grabs his food and he puts it into the fire. Kane gets his leg burnt completely off his body, so The Undertaker wins the Inferno match. The Phenom then approaches Vince and all McMahon can say is why. Undertaker takes Teddy Rubskin and he sets him on fire, and McMahon falls to his knees while crying like a little baby. Raw goes off the air with Undertaker throwing the Teddy up the ramp while McMahon crawls on his knees to watch the stuffed animal burn in hell. It looks like The Undertaker just broke Vince McMahon. Raw wins reliving the war this week. It's so sad seeing WCW put on a rough episode of Nitro after a pretty decent pay per view, but to give them credit, they did have better matches this week. Brett vs Booker and Nash vs Mysterio were definite crowd pleasers, and I probably would have given it to Nitro this week had they not cut away from matches and put so much focus on skits and promos away from the ring. Again, there's nothing wrong with backstage promos and pre tape promos, but their frequency and emphasis is completely overdone right now. On WCW's Monday Night TV show. Raw's on 87 points, Nitro's on 68, and we've got 19 ties on the board. Raw got a 5.5 rating this week, while Nitro bounced back from last week with a 4.8. This is the highest rating Nitro will get for the remainder of the Monday Night War. Next week on Nitro, The Nature Boy returns with a big announcement. The NWO Wolfpack invite Rey Mysterio into the group, and Scotty Steiner has a challenge that'll see Big Papa Pump main event Nitro once again. I love it. Over on Raw, Triple H and X-Pac get a shot at the tag team titles, an old rivalry gets reignited when Mankind faces The Undertaker, and we've got Stone Cold Steve Austin competing in the Raw main event. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you all for episode 175. Take care.